strength is force production. Production of force. The ability to produce force is strength. And that's all there is to it. And if you want to pretend that strength is something else, then you go ahead and pretend. And while you're at it, why don't you pretend that Jeffrey Epstein didn't kill himself, too? From the Asgard Company Studios in beautiful Wichita Falls, Texas, from the finest mind in the modern fitness industry, the one true voice in the strength and conditioning profession, the most important podcast on the Internet. Ladies and gentlemen, starting Strength Radio. Welcome back to Starting Strength Radio. Uh, good Friday afternoon to you. Uh, our little radio podcast comes to you on Friday. Um, every Friday, brand new, brilliant content, the likes of which cannot be and never has been duplicated anywhere on the Internet for obvious reasons. Now, this audio goes up. When did she put this thing up? The audio? It's on Friday Mid- morning. Early Friday morning? When? Midnight? or I think so. It's real early Friday morning. And the video goes up at noon on the thing you're actually watching right now. It goes up at noon on Friday. And, uh, you know, of course, the audio is for you to listen to while you drive to work in your busy urban commute between your house and wherever it is you work an hour and 45 minutes away. I don't see how you do that. Why do you have a job that requires you to be in a car an hour and 45 minutes on the way to work and on the way home? What the hell is wrong with you? Get a, look, just get a fence repair business or something, you know, but don't do that to yourself. That's stupid. I, 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 it frustrates me that, that you would voluntarily bring this level of hardship on yourself, but I guess you know what you're doing. I guess you are comfortable with three and a half hours in the car every day. Uh, you know, maybe you enjoy the peace and quiet. Maybe things aren't so good at home. Maybe you'd rather be sitting by yourself in the car than fighting with her, you know, than listening to the kids throw another baseball through the front window. You know, there's all kind of reasons why you might rationally choose to be in the car an hour and 45 minutes both ways every day. But I don't understand it. I, I couldn't do it. And, uh, you know, the fact that you can't, I guess that makes you better than me. I don't know. Anyway, it's time now for comments, comments from, from the haters. The haters. All right, and this uh, this comes from uh, Mug Flub. <laughs> Mug Flub. <clears throat> yes, because only leftists lie. Stick to strength training, Rip. Every time you open your mouth about anything else, you show what an ignoramus you are. <laughs> I like that word. I, I haven't heard ignoramus in a while. Yeah, That's it's been a while. A children's cartoon word, isn't it? <laughs> Is that like a hippopotamus? Is it ignoramus like a small hippopotamus? I'm not that fat, am I? I know, I'm a huge, fat, wallowing slob, but am I really muss size? I don't think so. Is there a comment about the si- your size in there? There always is. <laughs> I'm just not going to read. I'm not going to read that particular comment <laughs> right now. <clears throat> Got to save it. Okay. All right. No uh, says no name says, and this is not really a comment from the haters. It's just an interesting observation. If Epstein ran the starting strength program, his neck would have been too thick for Hillary to choke him out with. What he means for Hillary to choke him out. Because to say with would would imply that Hillary choked him out with his own neck, which is grammatically not, you know, correct, is it? It'd be interesting to see, though. 
It would be to have enough neck where Hillary could take her claws and take a chunk of your neck and wrap it around your neck and pull it tight enough to choke you out. I like how Hillary has that, claws like a fucking monster. She she does have claws. Yeah. Notice they never show her hands. <laughs> Ever wondered about why they never show her hands? Because they're not really hands. And finally, the depraved epic writes, who is Rip's Coke Connect? Now, by this, I'm I'm assuming that we're not talking about Coca-Cola. Or we're, we must be talking about cocaine. Cocaine. Since, since we've been... Uh, into personal disclosure of the past few episodes. I've never done cocaine. I swear to God, I've never done cocaine. I was afraid I'd like it too much, and I have never done it. I know a bunch of people that did do cocaine, like quite a bit of cocaine. (laughs) And the outcome was not good. But that's not why I didn't do it, because I don't have an addictive personality. I just... I was just afraid that it would be another, and it's expensive, and, you know, I've just always been broke and shit, and I'd never, uh, never uh, really had any interest in doing cocaine. I've never done acid either. You know, and I've got people telling me that that acid is good for you, that LSD is, you know, like... It's- if it's like of, a growth experience or some shit. There's a you know? lot of uh, therapists that are <clears throat> giving LSD to patients and then going through a um, session, and they say they get more done in that one session than like... Well, I, I've heard that. I've heard of people being treated with uh, for PTSD yeah, exactly. with LSD or mushrooms or something like that. Yep. I have no experience with it, so I I don't know. I don't know. Maybe it, maybe it helps. I don't know. It, you, mushrooms are supposed to change your life. Like you know, change your life. You heard that? Mm -hmm. You ever heard that? Bree, you never heard that they change your life? They make you puke. I do know that. You vomit when you, when you you heard that, right? Well, anyway, uh, I don't like to vomit, so I really dislike vomiting, so I'm not going to do that either. I'd rather not vomit then double my capacity as a human being. <laughs> that's how averse I am to vomit. <laughs> and that's comments Comment. from, from the, the haters. haters. Okay. Now, here that was a waste of paper. <laughs> All right. This thing is going to go over here. All right. We're going to save that. Now, I've got a note here in front of me about what we're going to talk about today. And here's what we're going to talk about today. Uh, We are going to talk about our little two-factor model that we have proposed uh, about the difference between training and exercising, right? And um, I think that it, it explains a lot of things about strength and conditioning that can't be explained as well with any other analysis. I think that it uh, it sheds a lot of light on what you should be doing and what is a waste of time. And uh, we present this two-factor model at every one of our seminars, and we talk extensively about the ramifications of analyzing sports preparation and life preparation with this model. And it applies to lots and lots of things. Hell, it applies to music. It applies to learning really anything that uh that requires that you do something with what you learn and uh it's uh it's a terribly useful model and then what we're going to talk about is how that how that two-factor model sheds some light on on three important trends in strength and conditioning in exercise and fitness, CrossFit, kettlebells, and functional training. So first, let's discuss the two-factor model itself. Exercising is the term. Uh, it's the term everyone is 
familiar with. You want to get some exercise. Your doctor tells you you need to get some exercise. Take some exercise was the term used a long, long time ago. Your doctor would, back in the 1940s, you'd waddle into the doctor's office and he would say to you, looks to me like you need to take some exercise. And uh, by that he meant get up off of your ass and do something uh, harder than you're doing right now. Despite the fact that he was not in any better shape than you were. Doctors have always been willing to advise (laughs) things. And uh, the exercise he was talking about really honestly meant just do something harder than what you're doing right now in a physical sense. For instance, if you don't walk during the day, then you need to start walking. And by starting walking, they weren't ever really particularly specific about what starting walking looks like. You just need to walk around a block or something. You know, park way out on the far edge of the parking lot to walk into the store. You know, if you go to the mall, pick an empty spot out by the street and walk all the way into the mall. And uh, that was exercising, taking some exercise. In the modern sense, exercising usually gets interpreted as either running or riding a bike or doing some stationary exercise like a elliptical or something or going into the gym and just fiddling around in front of the dumbbell rack all right that's exercising all right now this can be done exercising can be done by yourself if you get home from work and you go walk around the block you're exercising because that's more activity than you had at work assuming you don't have a walking job in which case that would be stupid Walking around a block, if you're a postman, (laughs) would be kind of (laughs) pointless waste of time and wouldn't even constitute exercise. If, on the other hand, you're an office worker and you uh, decide that you're going to start taking some exercise, and you come home and you walk around a block a couple of times, well, then you've upped your physical activity level, right? And there's nothing wrong with that. It's, it's perfectly adequate for some people. If your baseline is so low that walking around a block twice constitutes an increase in physical activity, well, hell, you got to start somewhere, so that's just fine. You know, that's what you need to do. Uh, if you're going to go to the gym, which is the, here it is, 2019, about to be 2020, uh the, the gym business has exploded over the past 30 years. I've sat here and watched it occur. When I opened my gym in 1984 in Wichita Falls, there were five places to train here and five places to go take some exercise in Wichita Falls. Now there are at least 32 places in Wichita Falls you know, in the same size market. 125,000 people in this market, 100,000 in Wichita Falls. And, and similar growth in exercise facilities have, have been seen all over the country, all over the world. Uh, I wonder how many gyms there were in, uh, in Shanghai in the People's Republic of China 30 years ago. I bet one or two. Maybe. If the, It may be that. It might have been illegal. Who knows? You know, it wasn't work being performed for the revolution, so it could very well have been none. Probably just the Olympic training centers there, and that's it. Could very well have been. Could very well have been. All exercise must be sanctioned by the state. (laughs) And similar growth has taken place in every major market across the world. So exercise has been on everybody's mind quite a bit for, you know, most people's the vast majority of most people's lifetimes you have to be old like me before you remember a time when there weren't any big strong guys wandering around except you right there's 
several of us listening to the show today remember when a guy squatting 500 pounds was an exceptional specimen. You know, nowadays, you know, most most gyms have got a guy in there squatting 500 pounds. Uh, so exercise is a, is a commonly encountered thing nowadays. What is not commonly encountered, what never has been commonly encountered, and what remains uncommon is a training approach to the concept of physical activity. Training is different from exercise. It's fundamentally different from exercise because exercise is what you do when you when your point in doing it that day is just to get hot, sweaty, and tired. It's just to elevate your heart rate, elevate your respiration rate. Is Exercise is what you do for the effect it produces on you at the end of the exercise bout or workout. All right. Exercise is done to burn some calories for the effect it produces immediately on heart rate and respiration. It is, it is not done as a part of a long time, uh, a long term approach to solving a problem. Whereas training is the process of accumulating a physiologic adaptation a physiologic adaptation that you have thought about, that you have determined is going to be advantageous for your physical situation. And the process has been designed specifically to produce that physiologic adaptation. Now, physiologic adaptation can be uh, on either end of the bioenergetic spectrum, okay? A physiologic adaptation to uh, the the challenge, the performance challenge of running a marathon, twenty six point two, is a completely different physiologic adaptation than one would require if performing in a weightlifting meet or a powerlifting meet. All right, they're on completely separate ends of the bioenergetic bioenergetic spectrum all right as a result the processes that would be involved in accumulating that physiologic adaptation over time will be completely different although the overarching principle is the same and the principle is we we Determine where we are now. A. B. We determine where we want to be, both in terms of the degree of adaptation and the specific nature of the physiologic adaptation. And then C. We design a program to be executed over time to get us to that goal. All right. Now, an easy way to think of that goal is a performance and a performance is a point in time where you demonstrate your ability to execute the physical activity at the highest level you can execute it. That level, that physical activity that you've chosen to do the adaptation for. If you sign up for Boston, that's your marathon, and the day of the Boston is your performance, okay? If you sign up for the Greater Texas Classic Powerlifting Championship, then that's the performance. You know well in advance when the performance is. You know what's going to be required of you that day in terms of the physical effort involved in executing that performance and you have prepared for it over a period of months, possibly years to better execute your 
physical performance that day. Exercise is not a process. Exercise is a workout. Exercise is a is an approach to the problem of physical activity that involves what we are going to do today to punch the ticket on the way home from work. You stop by the gym. Okay, you stop by the gym. You park the car way out at the edge of the parking lot, and uh, you get your gym bag out of the back seat. You go into the gym, and you you uh, go to the locker room. You sign in, right, and you go to the locker room. And you get your locker, and you get your gym clothes out of the bag. Throw your work clothes in the locker. Put on your gym clothes. Go outside into the gym, and then decide what you want to do today. Oh, you're going to use the leg extension machine because you've got to have legs. got to do legs. Everybody knows you've got to do legs. You might do the leg press machine. Might do some, some leg curls, you know, to balance out quads with hammies, right? Might go over to the uh, dumbbell rack and invent complicated movements with dumbbells, you know, like that and call, you know, this, this, this. That, this, this, that's one rip, right? Well, with the five-pound the- dumbbell. You hit all the, hey, you hit all the movements. All the deltoids. All the all delts, deltoids. all the muscle groups are all hit. Deltoids. All the movement planes, <laughs> all the directions of movement are hit. Uh, you might, uh, then you know, you might, you might even go up uh, from the five-pound dumbbells to the 10-pound dumbbells and do the same thing. Man, you're. Big jump. It's a challenge for today. I mean, we just we're feeling cocky, <laughs> so we go up to the ten pound dumbbells, and then let's see what else could you do. You got a lat pull. You got to go run the lat machine. Sit there and do some lat pulls, and then you're going to go over and ride the treadmill while you watch CNN, right? And have people just lie to you for thirty minutes because nothing is as satisfying as being lied to while you're being sweated upon at the same time. Well, you right? obviously hate yourself. You hate yourself. So it's make it's penance, yeah. you know. Make it's penance. <laughs> you listen to this shit, you go, God, <laughs> how can he say that? <laughs> He's just standing there saying that. And I have to endure this. And you do have to endure it because it's you're punching the ticket. You're paying your dues. You're getting some exercise. You're taking some exercise. You've uh, and then when you get off the through riding the treadmill or riding the elliptical, then you go back into the locker room and you, uh, you know, take your little gym clothes off and you wrap that towel around your waist and you go back and sit in the sauna because the steam room is broken again. If you're over right? forty-five, you don't bother with the fucking towel. You no, just, just, I I don't. You just talk and you have to find the youngest guy in there and just talk to him. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. That, that's really what. Yeah, I forgot about that. That's what you have to do. You got to go into the sauna completely naked and talk to the twenty-five-year-old kid that you know was not raised around other naked men. You know, when I was when I was in June, this is this is important. Guys my age and guys your age have been raised completely different oh, because in, in junior high school everybody in the 7th grade was in the shower with everybody else in the 7th grade taking a shower yeah, yeah. you know completely naked that's when you first you know <sighs> but that lasted a couple of days and pretty soon nobody gives a shit yeah, yeah, right you, everybody's wandering around in the locker room naked they put their clothes back on and they go back to school yeah. right and old guys like me don't worry about being naked in front of other men. Yeah. I, I, it's just not a deal, yeah. right? But little turds like you <laughs> are all, oh, oh, he's looking at my TT. He can barely see your TT. <laughs> to begin with, he can barely see it. He doesn't have his microscope with him. Okay. So he can't really see your TT. But why do you care? You know, I. Anyway, <laughs> that's what we call an aside. All right. So then you get out of the sauna and you go to the shower and you wrench off and uh, you uh, go back to the locker. You put your clothes back on, get your gym bag ready, and then you go back to the car and you have punched the ticket. You have exercised. 
That's what you have done today. And you're a good boy for having done that. Okay. And really, for lots and lots of people, this is all they need to do. You know, if you're not in terrible shape already and you don't really want to do this anyway, you're not in love with the physical aspects of your existence. You're just, uh, you know, one of these guys that just knows he, you know, he doesn't want his dad had high blood pressure and you don't want it. And you know, you got to do something to keep your health and stuff. And she's on your ass about your belly and everything. Then that's what you're going to do. Just go by the gym and exercise. That's fine. But there's a better way to do it. You can train. You can sit down and think about things. You can think about what it is you want to accomplish physically. Now, this is going to require that you prepare. This is going to require you to learn some things. Okay, It's going to require that you determine what is bullshit and what is not bullshit. Right? It's going to determine, it's going to require you to determine that not every approach to exercising as physical preparation applies to your particular situation. Some of it's complete bullshit. Uh, what's a good example of complete bullshit? Uh, anything that, that folds up and stores under your bed is complete bullshit. Anything being sold at 3 it, in the, o'clock in the morning? Or yeah, the infomercial stuff, stuff is yeah. usually bullshit. Um, you know, there's just... There's just a lot of a lot of things out there on the market that are that are bullshit, and I the reason I'm having problems uh, coming up with the name of one of these things that are complete bullshit is because I don't watch television, and I only deal with my little corner of the of the market, so I can't tell you. But you know what I'm talking about. If you'll think about what you want to get done physically. If you'll think about it, a lot of things that are available to you as a consumer do not apply to the problem of solving your physical situation. All right. Now, a large part of of uh, of answering the question, "How do I train correctly?" is going to is going to be determined by the performance, this thing over here on the on the end of the spectrum that you're preparing for. Not everybody wants to run a marathon. And there's a reason why a marathon is not the thing you want to prepare for if your goal is to just be healthier as a human being. All right. Marathons, uh, if you're a marathon athlete, if you're a competitive marathon runner, then you're, this is, this is competitive sports, all right? And let me say right up front that competitive sports are not about health. Competitive sports, sports competition is about winning, not about being healthy. If you've decided to enter a sporting competition, then your health has suddenly become of secondary importance to placing in the event. If you're an actual competitor, then, and not everybody enters a meet an actual competitor. You know, a lot of people enter a meet just to have, have a training goal, and that's a perfectly reasonable thing to do. But if you've decided that you're going to see if you can get your marathon time down below two and a half hours, then you're you're serious about this. And you will find over the course of, of trying to get your marathon time down over two and a half hours that your health has suffered in the same way that you might find that a 900-pound squat has compromised your health too. Because these are extremes. They're on the very tails of the bell curve. And the tails of the bell curve were usually where problems occur. And the, if, if you are just interested in being a more useful, functional human being, then 
there is a way to analyze what to do in order to tailor your training to produce that effect. And what you want to do is get stronger. Strength training is the middle ground, all right? Because, shut up and listen to me, because strength training is the type of preparation that produces results in every other field of physical endeavor. For example, if you are not strong and you want to be better at running, what should you do? Run or get stronger? Well, the dumbasses that are listening to this will say, well, you've got to run. And that's not true. The process of taking your squat from nothing, from 115 to 405, makes you a better runner. Three of my um, youth lifters have all said that when their squat went up, their 100-yard dashes have gone down. That's always the case, yes. especially with kids. Yep. It's always the case because running is, believe it or not, a series of sub-maximal repetitions with respect to your squat. One of the specific reasons that your kids are getting faster on their, on their sprint times is because their low back is stronger. We've observed this for decades. Yep. That if, you, if, you, if you've got a kid that you want to demonstrate this to, don't have them do anything but deadlift six times. Bring them in the gym, have them deadlift three times a week for two weeks, Time them in, time them out on the 40, and every single time their 40 will go down. Because a stable low back is a better force transfer segment between the body and the ground. Works every single time. And that's just an example of how getting strong benefits running. Now, on the other hand, does running make you stronger? No. It doesn't. So if you're going to do an activity that benefits both running and strength training and strength. So if you're going to do an activity that benefits both running and strength, what do you do? Run or train for strength? Well, you train for strength because that's logic. I, I, I don't understand why you would think that a healthy 25-year-old guy who gets his squat up to 550 suddenly can't run. <laughs> what, is, what is wrong with you? Why would you say something stupid like that? You know, not only has it been my personal experience that, you know, as a 550 squatter, I could run five miles three days a week if I wanted to. It's not good for my strength training, but I could do it because I did it. And the guys I trained with did it too. And everybody I know did it. All right. On the other hand, if all you did was run five miles and you didn't squat or deadlift or bench or press, then you got better at one thing and one thing only. Whereas we got better at everything. We got better at everything. When I was lifting weights I also played soccer I was a better soccer player I was real hard to run into I was hard to get off the ball okay when I was lifting weights I did all kinds of things played tennis and, and uh, flag football and all kinds of things because a, a young strong guy is capable of everything physical Whereas a guy that only runs is capable of running, and that's all. all right, there's more. It's there's a greater return on investment from getting strong than there is from pursuing any other avenue of accumulating a physiological adaptation in training. Okay, there, there, there. It's just makes more sense to get stronger than it does take that same amount of time and do anything else. 
Now, once you're stronger, what can you do? Well, everything better. Which means that if you're going to to play a sport, a sport like tennis or soccer or Olympic weightlifting or golf, then you can do it better if you're strong than, than you can if you're not strong. And obviously the uh, amount of strength you accumulate has got to be measured against the amount of time it takes to, to, to play the actual sport and do the sports skills that you have to execute during the sports performance. And this is where we get into the other part of the two-factor model. All right. Those types of activities that are dependent on accuracy and precision in in movement pattern execution, like tennis or golf or downhill skiing or BJJ or football or baseball or basketball or any other sport where accuracy and precision are part of the equation then the execution of the accuracy and precision part of sports preparation is called practice. So you have training on the one hand, which produces the physiologic adaptation that allows you to execute the movement patterns at a high level during the performance. And then you have the practice of the movement patterns themselves that will be executed with your now stronger body. These are two separate aspects of performance preparation, two completely separate aspects of performance preparation, and they must be thought of as separate processes because they are. Okay. Now to take an extreme example, golf, is uh, usually approached as a game. And a game is a thing that you do without any training for it. All right? Billiards is a game. All right? Golf is usually approached as a game. But if you add a training aspect to golf, what happens to your drive? guess what? It gets longer. And if you can take a stroke off of every hole, I kind of think that's of benefit to you as a golfer. But in order to do that, you got to get stronger because stronger hits the ball harder. You'd rather just buy new clubs. I understand that. It'd be better to, to, for you to just buy new clubs instead of having to squat and deadlift. Okay. How does squat and deadlift benefit golf? Doesn't look like golf, does it? It's not rotational. Doesn't matter that it's not rotational. It makes you stronger. Rotational comes with practice. Strength comes with squats and deadlifts. Training does not have to look like practice. And if you try to make it look like practice, you're diluting both the effectiveness of your training and your approach to practice, which must be specific to the performance, okay? In other words, practice cannot be executed with a heavy club because to use a heavy club, a club weight, a head weight, you're not going to use on the course under the assumption that that's going to make you stronger, what you're doing is practicing swinging the club slower, swinging it at a different mechanical pattern, a pattern that is should be extremely specific to what's actually going to happen on the course when you play golf as a performance. It's much better, much more effective to get 
strong in ways that just make you stronger. And then to take your now stronger body and practice it using the exact circumstances and conditions that will be required during the performance. That's a much better use of your time. Okay, because not getting under the bar doing your squats and deadlifts is wasting an opportunity to get stronger. And assuming that swinging a heavier club is going to make you stronger is both wrong because an extra five ounces on the club head does not, (laughs) five ounces doesn't make you stronger, honey. I'm sorry about that, but it just doesn't make you stronger. But what it does do is cause you to practice swinging the club in a different way than you are going to swing it during the performance. Now, what sounds better? Thousands and thousands of reps, exactly like you're going to execute them during the performance, or doing enough reps in a different way to constitute confusion in the movement pattern when it comes time to execute the performance. I don't think that you can make a case that swinging a heavy club or swinging a heavy bat or throwing a heavy baseball contributes to either strength training or practice in a productive way. Yet, that's what's done. It's what's done. You got strength coaches report that the golf coach wants to have the kids hook up a cable to the to the cable machine and do a rotational movement so it looks like golf. I, I, you know, I've got a couple of buddies that are high-level strength coaches in colleges and universities. They get so sick of this bullshit. But that's what's done. Sports coaches think that it that strength training must look like the performance, and it it doesn't. The most effective way to train for strength, if strength is what we want, is defined by the most effective way to get strong. There's no such thing as strength training for golf. There is strength training for strength. And there is practice for golf. Okay? that's The golf coach needs to practice his kids on the course and coach golf and leave the strength and conditioning coach to squat deadlift press bench press power clean to get a stronger golfer ready for practice okay now i hope this is clear it to everyone we explain this to this is perfectly intuitive and all you're doing when you try to make your strength training in the weight room look like the sport that your athlete is competing in is watering down the effectiveness of the strength training. The job of the strength coach is to get the kids strong, not to get the kids strong for golf. The strength coach hands the golf coach a stronger golfer, and then the golf coach converts strong into Longer drive by golf coaching. Okay? Same with everything else. Tennis, baseball, basketball, football. Any attempt to try to make the process by which we are going to accumulate the physiologic adaptation of strength look like the end performance movement patterns is a way to dilute the effectiveness of the time spent in the weight room. Now, I, I hope this is clear because no one has ever refuted this argument. If you've got a refutation for it, besides what is written, no, he didn't play golf. I don't want to hear that shit. Okay. Uh, you're right, I don't play golf. But I'm also smarter than you are. Okay. So if you've got, Uh, an objection to this, but it seems perfectly clear to me 
that the way you measure a strength coach's effectiveness in the weight room is not by how closely he can mimic the performance aspects of the athlete's sport in a loaded situation in the weight room. It seems to me that the way to judge the effectiveness of the strength coach is how much stronger he made the athletes in an objective way. How much more can the kid squat now than he did when he got there? What's his deadlift before and after? How much is he pressing overhead? How much can he clean? How much can he snatch? Do all those lifts go up? If they did, then the strength coach is doing his job. But if the sports coach comes in and insists that the strength coach have the athletes move in the weight room in a way that looks to the sport coach like the game, the sport coach has just fixed it up so that the strength and conditioning program is not optimal anymore. Okay? It's the sport coach's responsibility to teach the movement patterns used in the performance. It is the strength and conditioning coach. His job is to get the kid stronger so that he can more effectively perform the movement patterns used in the performance. Okay? Now, that in mind, we've got two factors in, in sports performance. We've got training which is the process of accumulating a physiologic adaptation that is specific to the demands of the sport. And we got practice, which is the process of getting better accuracy and, pre and precision in the execution of the, of the movement patterns specifically utilized in the performance. Two completely different things. Completely different things. One is a structural metabolic adaptation and the other is honing neuromuscular patterns that are embedded in the athlete's nervous system that allow accuracy and precision of movement that's specific to the performance. Two complete things. Though they have to be done at the same time. Okay? They have to be done while the other is being done too. So you've got practice and you've got training going on at the same time because both of those factors figure in to the performance. Okay. Both are necessary. All right. Now there, if you want to get out on the tails, we talked about earlier, the tail ends of the accumulated physiologic adaptation for uh, endurance would be a marathon. Now, what does practice look like for a marathon? Well, practice for a marathon would be running. And training for a marathon would be running. The practice aspects of marathon are beyond my scope. I don't know. But the training aspects of marathon, I know that these guys don't run 26 miles of training. That's not how they do it. And the practice aspects of marathon probably have quite a bit to do with the size of the field that leaves the start line that day. There are ways to get in a better place on the road. And these things have to be practiced, and you've got you've to get in the correct position and stay there. These are practice aspects of marathon performance. On the other end of the spectrum, what is practice for powerlifting? And what is training for powerlifting? Well, they're more similar than practice and training would be for football. All right, we're going to try to squat 800 pounds at the power meet. Squatting 800 pounds for a single and squatting 725 for a set of five are two different things. If you're going to practice, if you're going to perform heavy singles with equipment, you've got to practice heavy singles with the equipment. There's a practice as aspect to it. It's not intuitively obvious. At first, it seems like they'd be the same thing, but they're not. Just like 
going out and running is not the only thing that you have to do to get involved, if you get prepared for a marathon, okay? But out on the tails, practice and training begin to look more and more similar, whereas in the middle of the bell curve, what is practice for tennis? Practice for tennis involves being on the court with your racket, learning ball skills, learning racket skills, position skills, learning how to see where the ball is going to go, learning how to get where you need to be. All of these things are practice aspects of tennis. What is training for tennis? Squats, deadlifts, presses, benches, power cleans, because that's what makes you stronger for tennis. Is swinging a weighted racket <laughs> practice for tennis? Do, do you see why I laugh about that? How do you make your hips and legs the things that are involved in shuttling you rapidly across the court? How do you make those stronger with a weighted racket? How do you put an eight ounce leg weight on your ankles and shuttle back and forth across the, the court and assume that that is sufficient strength for your legs and hips, strength training for your legs and hips. When you could be taking the kid's deadlift from 135 up to 315 without a great deal of complexity, you know, this this involves that you take the giant leap of understanding here and 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 understand that I'm not advocating that you turn the marathon athlete into a power lifter. All right, if it, it would be you would be doing me a favor by assuming I'm intelligent enough to understand that we don't want marathon competitors to deadlift 475. But what I'm actually saying is it would be it would be better if a marathon competitor could deadlift 135 instead of nothing. That's the, that's the case I'm trying to make. You have to understand that I, I I don't want by training everybody for strength, I don't want to change their sport. I want to make them better at the sport they've chosen to compete in. And the sport you probably have chosen to compete in is just not being dead, all right? The sport of me staying alive is a very important sport. That's the one most of us participate in after we get out of school. Now, some of us stay in master's swimming. Some of us stay in master's lifting. You get to 50 years old. There are tennis leagues for old farts. You know, there's ways for us to continue to compete in sports. But a lot of people don't decide to stay in sports for the competitive part of the thing. Lots and lots of us, though, have decided we don't want to grow old and fat and and incapable and skinny and frail and everything else. And as a result of our decision to not give up, on being alive physically, what we've decided to do is maintain some level of preparation for it. So we train. If we're smart about it, we train. We don't just go in and exercise. We design things so that we get stronger. And depending on what else we need to do in our own particular situation, we may decide to do some conditioning. And that's certainly a wonderful thing to do. So most of us that have decided to to stay in the game, uh, the game of not being dead, have decided that we're going to train for something. Now, there are several things that are popular these days, uh, ways to do this, all right? And I earlier mentioned CrossFit, kettlebells, and functional training. Now, let's go ahead and talk about CrossFit first. CrossFit is a very, very popular exercise method and i say it's an exercise method because main site crossfit is not training main site crossfit is extremely vigorous high intensity exercising 
right? Because it is not programmed. It is intentionally kept random because the thinking is that random is better. Random is better only if you do not know specifically what physiologic adaptation you want to try to achieve. All right. And the vast majority of the most important physiologic adaptations that you can achieve are strength oriented. Strength training is the best adaptation. But if you only squat five sets of five or whatever they have at random, perhaps only once in three weeks or once in six weeks, that you know, changes all the time. You're not training the, for strength in the squat. You're exposing yourself to random hard things. And if those random hard things are also skill dependent, like snatches, like 30 snatches with 60 kilos for time, that depend on you being able to snatch the thing correctly, then you're going to have to be strong enough to snatch it that many times, and you're going to have to be good enough at snatching it to do it 30 times without hurting yourself. But if you don't train for strength and you don't practice the snatch, then you are essentially doing a performance with no preparation. And this is a problem. This is a problem. Now, CrossFit as a whole, I've been critical of for years. I was involved with CrossFit from 2006 until the last month of 2009. I know what goes on at CrossFit, and, uh, you know, Greg Glassman and I are still friends. But I disagree with their, with their training methods and the ways in which they motivate people are, are terribly, terribly effective, and sometimes that gets everybody in trouble. If you're terribly effective to perform in the absence of training or practice, you can see that that might present an injury risk. Okay. CrossFit on the whole, though, I think has been one of the best things that's ever happened to the exercise industry, especially the end of it that we occupy. Because CrossFit has put more barbells in more people's hands than anything in the history of the human race. There is no doubt that CrossFit has benefited both Olympic weightlifting and barbell training. Uh, as, As recently as 15 years ago, in the entire city of Dallas, Texas, there was one place to do the Olympic lifts in an organized setting and that was a guy's garage okay back in in the in the early 2000s uh, tom witherspoon was holding down the fort for the olympic lifts now there are countless places down there with bumper plates and platforms and good bars for you to snatch and clean a jerk okay it's transformed crossfit has completely transformed that end of barbell training all right, and, and CrossFit has done several other very important things for what we do. CrossFit taught you to expect to pay for coaching and for coaching education, which is the end of the business that I'm in. CrossFit essentially created a market for what I do, and I'm grateful to Glassman and CrossFit for having done that. But I recognize that there are problems with the methodology, and I disagree with it. And I think I've presented a case for the basis of my disagreement with it. And, I mean, there are intelligent ways to approach the thing called CrossFit. The other problem with CrossFit is that the intelligent ways to approach it are not often taught by most CrossFit coaches, because most CrossFit coaches lack the experience to understand the problems. They don't understand this two-factor model thing. 
and they don't understand how to correctly approach what it is they're trying to do. Yet they were made CrossFit coaches. They were allowed to open a CrossFit affiliate, and the general public doesn't know what the problem is. The general public never knows what the problem is with anything that's a problem because they're the general public, and they're busy with other shit, and they rely on people they consider to be professionals to make the correct judgment for them. And this is not a problem that's specific to CrossFit. My God, the entirety of strength and conditioning, the entirety of the fitness industry is 95% of the fitness industry is bullshit. You know, you, those of you that are paying attention to our podcast and familiar with our method, methods know the problems involved in walking into Gold's Gym someplace and getting one of the little kids on the floor to set pins for you on a, on a personal training appointment and do leg extensions. That's, they don't know anything about it. Furthermore, they're prepared to not know anything about this by the exercise science program that they're involved with at their little four-year school. You know, the, the, the profession of strength and conditioning coaching, barbell coaching, is not taught anywhere. And anybody that's good at this figured out how to do it by themselves or with our help. Okay? But you can graduate with a master's degree in exercise physiology and not have the slightest idea how to teach somebody to deadlift 135 off the floor. Happens every day. Happens every year to thousands and thousands of people all across the country. They're handed a master's degree in something they cannot practice. Now, if they want to if they want to do the laboratory aspects, you guys want to do Westerns the rest of your life, you go right ahead and do that. But in terms of making a living in a gym, you don't know what the hell you're doing. How's the general public supposed to sort all that shit out? Well, they can't because they're the general public. But my point is you're not helping anything, okay, because you don't know your job and you need to learn your job, okay? Word to the wise. Now, Kettlebells. Kettlebells are an interesting phenomenon. Kettlebells have been a fad at various points throughout the past hundred years. Kettlebells are supposed to be Russian, right? Russians are cool because Russians are severe. Russian communism built tough men, right? Russians are tough, you know. Uh, I, I, I don't want to uh, get into my judgment of Russian culture because that would be unnecessary. Uh, although I would like to observe that we won the Cold War. <laughs> we won the Cold War. All right. So, uh, Russian kettlebell, blah, blah, blah. You know, it's a fad. And let's look at, at kettlebells specifically. A kettlebell is a hunk of iron with a handle on it. It's asymmetrical. It's lighter on top than it is on the bottom. Any movement performed with a kettlebell Usually, except for a Turkish get-up, is a, is a swinging motion of some sort. Kettlebell competitions and kettlebell training involve multiple reps, lots and lots of reps. A kettlebell test is, uh, and I, I'm sure this varies with the federation or the association that you're competing in, a, a kettlebell test for competition is how many swings you can do in a period of time, five, 10 minutes, right? Anything done for five or 10 minutes is not strength training. Sorry, not strength training. Anything done for five or 10 minutes is obviously quite sub-maximal. And if it's sub 
maximal, it can't build strength. It can build endurance. You know, breathing exercises. It's just basically timed breathing and timed swinging. But the stronger you are, the heavier a kettlebell you can swing for 10 minutes. So the question would be, how do I get stronger in order to swing the kettlebell for 10 minutes? Swing the kettle, swing a heavier kettlebell for 10 minutes or do your squats and deadlifts. This isn't complicated, right? If you want to swing kettlebells, go ahead and swing kettlebells. But anything done for 10 minutes is not strength training. You know, you could argue that sets of 10 are strength training. I think that's probably too many. I like fives because they work for a century. Sets of fives work every time they're tried. Uh, but 75 kettlebell swings in a period of time is a 75 RM. It's not heavy. And if it's not heavy enough that the last rep is grindy and hard, then it's not building strength. So what would be the best way to build strength for kettlebells? Same thing that's the best way to build strength for football or tennis or golf or anything else is the exercises that are the most effective at making you strong, the exercises that involve a full range of motion, that involve a huge amount of muscle mass, that allow you to lift heavy weights. Those are the exercises that make you strong. And those exercises are the squat, the deadlift, the bench press, the press, and the Olympic lifts in order to keep power expression commensurate with increasing strength. Now, you know, people that are listening to this will say, well, you know, it's just Ripito's opinion. All right? What about the inclined bench press? Why leave that out? because it's not using the most amount of muscle mass over the longest range of motion and therefore doesn't let you use the greatest amount of weight. And what is strength? Strength is force production. Strength is force production. That's all strength is, is force production. Force production is strength. Strength is force production. Production of force. The ability to produce force is strength. And that's all there is to it. And if you want to pretend that strength is something else, then you go ahead and pretend. And while you're at it, why don't you pretend that Jeffrey Epstein didn't kill himself too? So anything that is done for time is not strength training, right? This is why sprinters who run for 10 seconds in a 100-meter sprint also trained with barbells. They're running for time, but they know that sprinting by itself doesn't make you strong enough to be a better sprinter. They squat, they deadlift, they train with weights. They always have because they've got this figured out. For some reason, their brothers on the longer end of the scale, the 10,000 meter guys and the marathon guys hadn't figured that part of it out yet. Uh, it's their coaches. It's never the athletes. It's always the coaches. If you're going to run, uh, or you're going to do anything for time, you're doing a, a, a sub-maximal RM expression of strength. And an increase in your absolute strength will, will improve the performance. Kettlebells, having been done for time, High reps for time are not strength training. If you like doing kettlebells, wonderful. Do kettlebells. I will tell you this. The only uh, young person, you know, 40-year-old woman that we've ever had at a, at, a, at a starting strength seminar that we could not get into a below parallel squat was a female kettlebell champion. Wouldn't go down there. 
Couldn't go. To, I couldn't get one squat rep below parallel out of her. It was a weird day. Had never had it happen before or since. But uh, that's what I think kettlebells bring to the table. Now, functional training. Now, there's an interesting thing. If you've been on YouTube or you have read Sports Illustrated or you have looked at ESPN or been exposed to any of the media that are covering Division I college athletics and pro teams, then you have seen what is called functional training. You've seen an incredibly talented athlete being forced to stand with one foot on an unstable surface holding a light dumbbell in one hand and a heavy dumbbell in the other hand, and then switching the position of those two implements and doing it on the other foot. Because this is functional training. These are the kind of things this guy needs to to do on the field. Except that it's not what he does on the field now is it that's not what he does on the field okay the strength coach ought to be held accountable for making the players stronger right now at the professional level most of the strength and conditioning people that are employed by the professional sports teams their primary role is to, believe it or not, to not get anybody hurt. Not to make anybody stronger. Because the assumption is, is, hey, this guy's already strong enough to play, you know, football for us for $4 million a year. What the hell are you going to do in the weight room that's going to make him better? Well, if that's the case, why have the weight room? You know, if he's already strong enough, what the hell have a weight room for? Why don't you have, just have a BOSU ball room? You know, but I'll tell you, the guys on the field that are the most effective guys on the field, the ones that everybody else on the field is afraid of, are the strongest guys, aren't they? You know that. If a guy is strong, he's a better player. So why can't we get him stronger than he is right now? Well, One of the best explanations for why we can't get him stronger is because we have been taught as strength and conditioning coaches that unstable surfaces and light weights are the best thing to produce functional fitness. Functional training does not make you stronger because it can't. And if you'll go back to the two-factor model of sports performance preparation, you'll understand why. Training is the process of accumulating physiologic adaptation over and above where we are right now. That's what training does. It gets us better over time. To to do the metabolic and structural force performance things that are necessary for that sports performance. And practice is what we do during the performance and get better and better at what we're actually doing, actually doing during the performance. And what is functional training? What is standing on a BOSU ball with a 10-pound dumbbell in one hand and an 80-pound kettlebell in the other hand doing for either accumulating a physiologic adaptation or practicing the precise sports movements patterns that are required during the performance? It does neither. It does neither one of them. And it is a waste of time. And so what you're relegated to is an exceptionally genetically gifted, physically intelligent kid coming onto your team that is going to be demonstrating what he's already got, what he brought with him to the team because you're not giving him anything. You're not making him stronger, and you're not making him better at his position. If you're relying on the functional training bullshit and the strength in the in the weight room to get something accomplished, right? So what you're doing 
is failing, you're failing to develop his potential as a player by doing this functional training bullshit waste of time that is all the rage. It's the fad right now. Ready to force development training. Making him more making him more explosive. Making him more agile. Things that are so dependent on his genetics that we're wasting time doing it. Power. Power production is force production. Strength displayed quickly. What's the best way to, to improve power? To try to get his display time down? Or to increase the amount of force he can produce during the time he's already using, developing that display? Well, all you need to know is you can improve an athlete's vertical jump about 20% at most. But you can double his deadlift without a lot of trouble in just several months, especially with kids of that kind of genetic talent. You can make them much, much stronger in a very short period of time and improve their power that way. This is just an algebra problem. Okay? Power is force times distance over time. The T part of that variable doesn't vary very much. It's not very trainable. But the force part, the strength part, how much he can deadlift, how much he can squat, determines far more about how hard that kid can hit you than making him more springy. Look, he was springy when you hired him. That's why you hired him. We already know he's springy, right? But he's not as strong as he could be. And if you hire a strength coach that actually knows how to make him stronger, then that kid will be a much, much better player for you than if you have him standing around on an unstable surface against which he cannot develop maximum force. Because the instability is the bottleneck and not the force production. Keep that in mind. If you set up your training so that the instability is the bottleneck instead of the amount of force that can increasingly be performed during the training process and thereby accumulate a physiologic adaptation where he's producing more force, then you're fixing it up to this kid so that this kid can't get stronger. Think about it like this, okay? You've got two things involved in the preparation for sports performance. You have training, which produces an accumulation of a physiologic adaptation, the specifics of which are dependent on the nature of the performance. The physiologic adaptation is not specific to the movement patterns that you're going to display with that physiologic adaptation. The accumulation of the physiologic adaptation should be accomplished in the way that causes the most efficient accumulation of the physiologic adaptation. It, you don't, in other words, you don't have to squat with your offensive lineman stance in order to have the squat be specific to the offensive line. The squat is not specific to the offensive line. The strength is. So how do you get stronger? Well, you get stronger with the stance that you need to squat the most weight in. And now you're stronger. Right? And then, after we have established a process for accumulating the physiologic adaptation, now we have to understand that our sport that we're going to play is, 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 involves specific movement patterns in its execution. We must practice those specifically. And practice is exquisitely specific to the performance, whereas training is not. Okay? Now, I've written about this quite a bit. Okay? All right, and this discussion, this, this two-factor model, applies to athletes. Now, what about you that just want to get better at, at not being dead? 
Well, you need to train. You have to accurately assess the physiologic adaptation you want. And I hope you understand that that's most likely going to be strength. And if you understand that, then what's the best way to get strong? And that question is easily answered. And we do it here every Friday. Okay. So your questions, as always, are welcome. But good questions we accept on the website at startingstrength.com. Where, where they need to send these to? Where's our... Where's our uh, the report, if you'll send the, the report at startingstrength.com, there's a link for you to to submit questions for the Q&A. If this discussion prompts any any question, I'm sure it should. I want you to, to talk to us about it. So ask us, where what have I left out? I'm sure I've left quite a bit out. And if I can clarify this, this is productive discussion. And I hope it makes you think a little bit better, think a little bit more clearly about what it is you want to get accomplished. So submit those questions and uh, uh, let us know what we can clear up. We're always looking for future things to talk about here on the show. Uh, I think that about nails it. So uh, looking forward to hearing from you. And we'll see you next Friday on Starting Strength Radio. Later. Later.